So this morning, I wish to set the scene for the budget on Wednesday. This should be, as Annalisa has said, this should be one of the most significant budgets in our peacetime history. Why? Well, because we are facing three of the most serious crises that coming together our country has ever faced. Immediately, we face, of course, the crisis of coronavirus as it impacts upon our country with potentially well, immensely dangerous and already for some tragic consequences. And after 10 years of harsh and unnecessary austerity, we also face a social emergency with extremes of poverty and inequality and crises in every one of our core public services. And of course, we're confronted by the overall existential threat of climate change and the, well, the growing and deeply troubling realisation that we're rapidly running out of time to avert a climate crisis. So let's be clear on the question of coronavirus. This is not a time for party politics or partisan behaviour. I want to thank and pay tribute to the work and the professionalism and the dedication of the country's chief medical officer and the chief scientific advisor. <coughs> I also want to express my thanks, as always, my admi admiration to the RNHS staff who once again, as always, are rising to the challenge of providing us with the care and the treatment we need, despite being under huge existing pressures. As an opposition, we will support the government in implementing plans that are needed to keep our people safe and out of harm's way. Anything we say or do to support constructively the policies and programmes we believe needed to tackle this health emergency. So in that spirit, let me say that there are lessons to be learned already. The first is speed of action. Of course, the Prime Minister should have called COBRA sooner. Days and hours matter when you're dealing with a crisis as significant and with the urgency that is needed. The Chancellor also should have made clear immediately, 10 days ago, in a major public statement and to Parliament, that the government stood ready to do everything necessary to support our economy and to participate in global action to maintain market confidence. In these circumstances, you need to be fast in demonstrating that there's a clear plan of action nationally but also internationally. Blind optimism is no substitute for a plan. Attempting to let out assuring noises in dribs and drabs is not enough and has proved to be not enough. The government's delaying of any statement of an economic plan uh, until the budget date itself doesn't seem to appreciate the urgency of action that's needed to promote confidence and reassurance amongst, well, business investors, of course, and businesses themselves and consumers, but also workers and their families. That's why in the absence of any announcements from the government, last Monday I published my advice to the government on the basics of a five-point action plan for the Chancellor. The action plan simply brings together the basic steps any government would take in dealing with the potential economic impacts of an emergency of this scale. Naturally, it starts with a call for co the coordination by the the Treasury, the Bank of England, the OBR and the business bodies and the TUC of an overall and regular ongoing assessment of the potential impacts of the spread of this virus. We need to monitor constantly the consequences for production and consumption and GDP and, yeah, the resilience of our financial system too. We've heard some assessments by individual bodies such as the Bank of England, but no authoritative, coordinated assessment dialogue amongst our national institutions. So just as the Chief Medical Officer has been able to reassure people with his openness in reporting, so the Chancellor should also be regularly reporting to the public on the economic progress of this situation. The Treasury should also take responsibility for coordinating departmental impact assessments and resource planning in order to prepare a funding plan for increased resourcing for our agencies and departments and they should use a variety of scenarios reflecting different possible levels of the severity of the outbreak, just as the medical officer does with regard to the clinical consequences. What concerned me and still does is the tardiness, 
by the Chancellor in seeking to reassure the public and markets more comprehensively that, well, the government stands ready to intervene in the economy. It's best to be straight with people now and acknowledge the limited effectiveness of monetary policy and make it absolutely clear that the government will back fiscal measures to overcome short-term demand and supply issues, including li liquidity challenges, and to provide the detail of these measures now. Of course, attention needs to be given to the impact on vulnerable groups like the, likely to be particularly affected by the outbreak. And that includes families of individuals who've contracted the virus and households where self-isolation and sick leave are required. The vague statements from the Chancellor so far lack the detail to give confidence to many very well, financially vulnerable people. Often in precarious work, the assurance that they'll be supported and protected. Immediately, we need to give the details of the protections plan for workers, including paid sick leave guarantees for all workers of whatever status from day one and sick pay for self-isolation. The gig economy, zero-hour contracts and earning thresholds means around two million workers are ineligible for sick pay, statutory sick pay at the moment. It's unacceptable that some of the lowest paid workers who need to self-isolate will be forced to make a choice between their health and financial hardship. The government's emergency legislation and the actions they're bringing forward must guarantee that the right to sick pay from day one will include those people who are not currently eligible for statutory sick pay and that no one on social security will be sanctioned if they miss appointments. The Prime Minister uh, appears to be particularly out of touch on this issue. He stated last week that those who do not qualify for statutory sick pay can claim universal credit. Apart from the existing problem of the five-week wait for payment, you can't make at the moment a claim for universal credit online because you have to meet a work coach. And that means you have to go to a job centre at the start of the claim. Also, to get an advance in universal credit, which is a loan, you have to go to the job centre, have your ID checked. Some people will not be able to get the money at the start of the claim as a result. The key issue is that no one, no one, should have to choose between health and hardship. And you know, this is a matter of public health concern for everybody. The Prime Minister clearly does not understand how the system works. So someone in government urgently needs to take an active lead on this and consult with the trade unions on the measures that are necessary as this emergency develops. You know, international coordination was critical during the financial crisis of 2007-2008. And although it's been reported that there's been some communication between finance ministers, it's certainly not clear that it's of the scale or depth of coordination of 2007-2008. As a result of, as a result, whatever statements have been made have not had the effect of steadying markets or reassuring people more generally that there's an internationally agreed strategy to address this emergency. You know, whatever criticism people may have had of Gordon Brown's policy strategy in the banking crisis, no one can question the international leadership he showed and the focus and determination he brought to dealing with those events globally. I regret that we've not seen that leadership commitment, indeed political, diplomatic or indeed managerial ability from either the Prime Minister or Chancellor so far. So I just say gently, someone needs to get a grip. As in the past, the UK could and should play a critical role in mobilising the international bodies we have, in particular the UN, to agree a global response to deal not just with the current wave of this pandemic, but the possible subsequent waves. The coronavirus is, infection has exposed the social emergency that we face in our public services after 10 years of austerity. Ten years of cuts and failure to invest in our public services have meant that we're extremely ill-prepared for dealing with this type of large-scale health risk to our community. Our dedicated and professional NHS workers will always, they'll always do their utmost to rise to whatever health challenge is thrown at them, we know that. But they're hampered by ten years of Conservative-led governments refusing to provide the resources needed to deal with a growing and an ageing population. 
you know the NHS is already under intense pressure after years of underfunding and understaffing. 17,000 beds have been cut. Bed occupancy levels were at 94% last week and critical care bed occupation was at 80%. These are the beds we rely upon in episodes like the coronavirus. The NHS is also short of 100,000 staff, including 40,000 nurses and thousands of doctors. And of course, uh, look, of course an emergency cash injection for the NHS is needed in the budget to help deal with this outbreak. And the Chancellor has said that the NHS will get what it needs. The expression of blank cheque has been used. But we also have to recognise that the NHS needs putting on a long-term stable footing with secure financial backing from the government in this budget. Just as we have over the coronavirus outbreak, we must listen to the clinicians and the experts when it comes to what's needed in the long term, not just in the immediate crisis. Worryingly, directors of public health still don't know their public health allocation for the next financial year starting in, in three weeks, which means they could be cutting nurses' workloads at a time when those very nurses may be needed to deal with the coronavirus. But my only hope is that What's rumoured is the public announcement of public health allocations has been held back by Dominic Cummings for a publicity splash on Budget Day. Whatever is announced on public health spending, it needs to recognise that public health budgets have been cut by a billion in recent years. And if we are ha to have a sustained control of the coronavirus and cope with the growing health needs of our population, we need an investment of at least that quantum. We know that staff in the NHS will do the absolute best job they possibly can in difficult circumstances that they're facing during this busiest period. Our NHS has previously navigated outbreaks of flu, monkeypox and Ebola and everyone in the NHS has our full support. But there's to be, if there's going to be any good that comes out of this tragedy, of this outbreak, my hope is that it serves as a wake-up call needed to secure the long-term resources for our NHS. Just as the coronavirus has exposed the vulnerability of our NHS due to a decade of austerity, the impact of that austerity on our social care services is potentially even starker and more dangerous. Social care in our country is already in crisis. 87 people die each day before they receive the care they need. There are over 122,000 staff vacancies in social care. The majority of the people who do receive social care support are older or disabled or vulnerable people. These are the people most at risk of the coronavirus infection. Since 2010, an £8 billion funding gap in social care budgets has been brought about by austerity. As a result, as many of you will know, providers and local authorities are already stretched near breaking point. Any further pressure as a result of widespread infection are, or major outbreaks in care homes has the potential of fracturing our fragile social care system. A large section of our care workforce is also under threat from the government's recently announced immigration policy. The GMB union's research calculates the government's immigration policy will cost the care sector 500,000 staff. Without foreign care workers, our system would collapse. The message is clear to the Home Secretary. Do not put our social care system at risk. Pragmatism must override ideology. Social care in this country also still often falls on the shoulders of family members. And usually, it still falls to the older women in families. You know, it's many of these women whose pension age was increased without proper consultation or notification, who were effectively robbed of many years of their pension, and who this government, despite all of Boris Johnson's pre-election promises, has refused to compensate. When I met the WASPy women last week, it's no wonder they were angry still at their treatment. It's clear 
that we need more in this week's budget than another round of prevaricating consultation on social care. We need concrete plans backed up with both immediately available but also long-term solid finances. Do you know, we've also heard there's been some discussion in government about the potential of social disorder associated with the coronavirus outbreak. Look, no matter how distant this prospect is, it should force the government to take an objective look as well at our justice system. It's also in crisis. I just quote the Justice Select Committee. The Justice Select Committee calculated a £1.2 billion funding gap. In prisons, the Institute for Government has reported a sharp rise, and I quote, a sharp rise in deaths, violence, self-harm, poor behaviour and drug use, as well as a drop-off in efforts to rehabilitate prisoners. All of which the Institute said could be linked to cuts in government spending on prisons and a fall in the number of prison officers. Now, prison on prison assaults and self-harm have more than doubled since 2010. And on our streets, police numbers have been cut by 23,000. You know, the management or the mismanagement of our economy over the last decade has made us especially vulnerable to shocks to the system like this outbreak. The UK economy has experienced the slowest recovery from a downturn in over a century. Productivity growth has averaged a dismal 0.3%, putting firms in a precarious position when supply chains are disrupted. Business investment is already flatlining before the crisis. And we now have 4 million people in insecure work with nearly a million on zero-hour contracts, meaning millions of workers do not have guaranteed sick pay or other protections. According to the New Economics Foundation, 10 years of austerity, cuts to our public services has drained 100 billion from our economy. It's caused a social emergency combining both crises in our public services with high levels of poverty and insecurity. Universal credit. It continues to be rolled out with 2 million families losing more than £1,000 a year. 750,000 households losing an average of £3,600 a year from the two-child limit. 4 million of our children now live in poverty. Over two-thirds of them are in households where someone is at work. What does that say about low wages? And you will have seen the Marmot report last week. It showed that life expectancy has failed to increase for the first time in 100 years, and for the poorest 10% of women, life expectancy has declined. To tackle this social emergency, we need a fair taxation system that reverses many of the Tories' tax cuts to the rich and corporations and tackles the, well, what's been described as the current industrial scale of tax avoidance and evasion. Instead, all that is hinted at so far is a lifting national insurance threshold, and the bulk of the benefits of that will go to the better off. It's also been hinted there'll be various relatively minor tax relief reforms and the introduction of free ports. And the free ports have a notorious reputation as tax havens and for displacing existing jobs and existing investment. So the government is set to continue to ignore the hardship caused by universal credit, the two-child limit, bedroom tax, and for disabled people, the rollout of PIP. This budget has also been much typed for the start of, as Emily said, the so-called levelling up, especially in infrastructure investment outside of London and the South East. The government said 100 billion over five years has been proposed. Just to put that in context, had the Tories invested what was needed on infrastructure over the last 10 years, at least 3% of GDP... 192 billion more would have been spent. So it's just over, they promised, just over half of what they've failed to spend over this last decade. What the government has, well, what investment the government has made has, yes, has disproportionately favoured the capital. IPPR North has calculated that transport investment has increased by two and a half times more per person in London than in the North in the last decade. And the government's much vaunted additional infrastructure spending just fails to go anywhere near filling the hole in investment the Tories have created or what is needed. And even more disappointingly, we learnt last Thursday that the publication of the government's, well, much vaunted 
inf national infrastructure strategy has been delayed yet again. Four years ago, I launched um, Labour's campaign to tackle regional inequality and then called for a rewrite of the Treasury Green Book, consideration of a Barnett-type funding formula for the regions, the move of large sections, the Bank of England, the Treasury and a national investment bank outside of London. Well, we've just seen a lot of kites flown by the Chancellor this weekend attempting to plagiarise these ideas, but no one's holding their breath in anticipation of them happening on the scale needed so far. Far from levelling up, the IFS has made it clear that the austerity is baked in to the government's plans. Their assessment is that £54 billion of current spending is needed just to get back to spending per head of 2009-2010 levels. The government holds out no hope of ending or let alone reversing its austerity. And for those that believed Boris Johnson's promises of change, they face, well, the risk of five years of disappointment after 10 years of decline. Of course, addressing the coronavirus and the social emergency in our country are the immediate issues. But hanging over all our heads is the ever-present existential threat of climate change. Despite warm words from the government on prioritising the environment in this budget, there's little evidence of the seriousness and the imminence of the climate emergency has even penetrated government thinking. The IPPR's Environmental Justice Commission has published last week its report, arguing that the government needs to spend an additional £33 billion a year on measures to tackle climate change, if it is just to reach its target of net zero carbon emissions by 2050. And we've seen various capital projects have been listed by the government on decarbonisation of housing, public buildings, carbon capture, electric vehicles, flood defence. But looking at them, the sums are very slight and judged inadequate to address the system shifts that are needed. And there's nothing that the Conservatives have said that, they, that indicate that they have any sense of urgency or the ambition that's required to tackle the threat of climate change. Do you know if the UK is going to have any credibility as hosts of COP26 later this year, we need to be seen to be leading in the implementation of, yes, what we proposed, a Green New Deal, backed with sufficient funds to decarbonise our economy overall. But that also means we have to address the role of the finance sector in the UK in financing fossil fuels and contributing to climate change. Look, in conclusion, I can't overstate the significance of this budget. Of course, the immediate and pressing challenge this, this week, in this week's budget, is to ensure that the necessary resources are delivered to our NHS and to our social care services to meet this health risk head on, to contain it and to defeat it. Resources are needed to ensure members of our community are protected from both the medical harm, but also the financial hardship that threatens them from this outbreak. However, the natural, the natural focus on the coronavirus should not be a reason or an excuse for not addressing the equally serious and dangerous threats from the social emergency created from a decade of decline and the, from a, addressing the climate change crisis we also face. The scale of government intervention on both these emergencies, muted so far, fails to recognise the significance of the threats we face from the rundown of our public services and also, as importantly, from the running out of time to halt the climate crisis. I hope, I just hope the government has woken up to the state of our public services and the poverty and insecurity in which so many of our people live. I hope, I can only hope, that the fires in Australia, the burning of the Amazon forest and the flooding hitting even our own country has so chastened the government that they'll act this week. If not, we're told there is likely to be a further fiscal event later this year. We will need then, all of us, to join others to mobilise a social movement on a scale that forces action. That will be for a new Shadow Chancellor to support us in that campaign. And I'm sure that he or she will. Thank you very much. <laughs>